Hello, everyone, and welcome to TSAM Digital. I'm Ana Luisa, and today I am joined by Ashmita Gupta, the Director of Analytics from Light Data. Welcome, Ashmita. Thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Ashmita, would you like to say a couple of words about yourself and your work and the company? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm Ashmita Gupta, as Anna said. Um, I run the Line Data Analytics service. And in this role, I work very passionately with clients, tap into their data and leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning to derive some insights that can help them innovate and bring more value to their operations. I, as in, in, a, as this, in this role, I manage a team of uh, data scientists, data engineers, and the technical services uh, to provide an end-to-end -end solutions to our clients. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Ashmita. Um, so today I wanted to talk about trends in AI adoption within the asset management space. So um, what are you seeing in regards to this? Yeah, so Line Data, uh, we conduct a global asset management survey every year, uh, with the exception of 2020. And what we have seen this year, especially after COVID, is quite striking change in preferences within the asset management uh, space. So, for example, compared to 2019, when uh, for, for most managers, the priority was investment performance and uh, client acquisition. Fast forward to 2021, it's completely changed now. Now the focus is more on cybersecurity, cloud adoption, uh, operational risk. So it's, it's like two years of transformation have happened within two months uh, as a result of COVID. And now we see a lot more firms using artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning to not just for their investment performance or alpha generation, but also on the for their operational efficiency as well. For example, a lot of day-to-day -day middle and back office processes are very manual and prone to you know, human error. There are patterns in that data in those processes that we have found where firms can leverage these data-driven insights to enhance, to better those processes. And uh, another uh, important uh, trend I have, I've been seeing is, and the reason for you know, this uh, shift towards um, operational efficiency is that you know, on, the, on, the, as on the investment performance side, typically the firms that use um, machine learning, they do get a competitive advantage and the results are quick and uh, perhaps quite significant. But the benefits, they, la they don't last that long. I mean, eventually there is price discovery in the market, other firms will catch up and then the, the firms lose that competitive advantage. Whereas applying these technologies, these tools on the operation side, it can be slow to derive uh, from, a, from a benefit perspective, but we do see long lasting effects because it, it brings out this behavioral change in the people who are involved in these day-to-day -day tasks that can benefit the firm over a longer term. So quite a, quite a unique change, uh, but uh, it is good to see now more adoption of artificial intelligence um, across the whole uh, front, middle and back office and, and more areas within the firm, not just in the front office space. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a really exciting time and also really challenging, but interesting at the same time. And I was wondering if um, you can talk to us about how um, AI and machine learning can address the challenges of failed trade settlements. Uh, certainly, yeah. And so, as I was mentioning, you know, there's more insights in the data uh, around day-to-day -day tasks, for example, trade settlements. And, and what's sort of triggered um, the urgency on applying these innovative tools to address uh, these failures is the incoming EU regulation, the um, CSDR, which is the Central Securities Depo Depositories Regulation, is coming up with uh, the um, settlement uh, discipline regime, which is, you know, which is enforcing the participants within the EU market to follow certain processes and ensure um, reduced uh, settlement failures. Um, just to give you a little bit of summary of what's that involved, there are certain elements of this uh, new regime. It's uh, the, the three key parts of this being increased monitoring and reporting of wherever there is a, a failed settlement. Secondly, there are penalties that are imposed on the, um, on the counterparty that fail to deliver, whether it's the buy or the sell side. And thirdly, which is again still to be confirmed, is the mandatory buy-ins, uh, which is where most of the 
uh, punitive damages are going to be because then you're enforcing the counterparty to buy in in the market if they are failing to deliver the right security. So that being said, to, to walk you a little bit of how this all applies in the failed settlement space is, so there are three reasons again for uh, trades to fail to settle. First is uh, the counterparty cannot deliver the security. Second is uh, the settlement, the SSIs, which are the settlement instructions are wrong and hence they cannot settle. And finally, the third is even before it reaches that stage, the trades fail to confirm with the counterparty. And it starts with this third one first where the, 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 the firm has to first confirm the trade with their counterparty then enhance it with the updated settlement instructions and finally it goes for settlement. What, what we are seeing and what's very interesting is when we work with some of our clients uh, to, to analyze what's happening in this uh, process is there are more repeatable mistakes. There are patterns in the data where we've seen that are indicative that if sort of addressed in advance can avoid the downstream failure effects. For example, uh, identifying more like derivative-based securities. They did a project with one of our clients is we, they, were, they were trying to figure out why certain type of these securities, these derivative securities are always having to have some amendment after the fact. And what we realized that it's, it's the way they are booked in the system that's causing them to fail downstream. So there are benefits to um, looking at uh, machine learning uh, because there is huge amount of data within every firm around their trading and uh, matching and settlement. And by allowing them to have these uh, alerts upfront on where the likelihood of a certain trade getting failed or having a problem uh, in the downstream processes can save a lot of hassle for the operations team when they uh, later on in the process. So it, it's a very, very lucrative area at the moment. There's a lot of demand we are seeing from our, from our clients and prospects in the marketplace to address these uh, failure scenarios. Thank you very much for that. And um, how could firms be successful in their AI initiatives? Can you tell us a bit about what works and what doesn't? Absolutely. Uh, now that we've uh, done that a few times, uh, uh, we've got some experience of saying, yes, this works and this doesn't work. Um, where we see firms being most successful is where they have a very focused approach and it has to come from business. So AI is just a tool uh, to accomplish something. It's a means to an end. It, so in order to be successful, the firms have to first identify a couple of problem areas within the business, um, because if they, if they start taking it as a technology initiative and the technology and the business are not aligned, uh, the chances are, you know, it will never take off in a proper way uh, or even end uh, in, within the timeline. So if the business can set a right priority, can identify a few use cases where they can show quick wins, then that kind of starts this whole process of uh, you know, adopting it at a more wider scale within the organization. So the first step is to find the right problem area, the right use case where um, you see the AI can help. The second step is you, AI is, again, it requires a cross-functional team involving some um, business domain experts and the right level of technology people, um, not just data scientists and data engineers who are going to model the data and work with the data, but at the same time, somebody has to, once the model is built, somebody has to deploy the model and make sure it runs in a seamless manner in production. So um, often firms do not have the expertise in-house to carry out all the steps. So there are partners and other firms available where it's prudent to work with them who've already done this before and then know what are the best practices, what are the ways to accomplish it. So it reduces firms' total cost of ownership and also gives them a quick win. And finally, uh, they have to also make sure that whatever systems, whatever AI tools being deployed, there is a right uh, action that's being taken on, on the results of that. Um, you know, the analogy like, you know, you have a weather app giving you, oh, there is a 55% chance of rain. 
but it requires an action from from my side to take an umbrella right otherwise i'll still get gonna go get wet so likewise if you have um, this kind of a model which is giving you a signal or an alert to say some this trade is going to go bad then somebody has to take action on that trade for example and identify um, that it and make sure that it gets fixed before any further downstream processes. So those are the three key areas I would say that you know if firms can get their uh, processes can get their teams together, um, then there's more likelihood that you know these quick wins can then create more incentives to explore other areas in the firm. Thank you so much, Ashmita. It was really fascinating to talk to you today about this, and um, looking forward to speaking again. Likewise, thanks a lot, Anna.